well, certainly on a long winding journey in life, and the road is steadily onward and upward, but it's uh, getting steeper, and pretty soon we'll be leaving the uh, smooth pavement, and uh, as we can read in the spirit of prophecy, the so-called comfort, creature comforts that we're used to, we'll have to set aside, and it will be rather rocky and uneven, but we are promised that with what our Savior shared with uh, the New Testament believers that the road that leads into his kingdom is straight and narrow, but it is definite and it's not questionable, windy or wishy-washy. And uh, certainly, while few will be there that end up finding it, I pray that as many as possible in the time left in these closing hours of probation would find that straight and narrow path into God's kingdom. Along this journey, we're certainly traveling with friends, loved ones, um, young and old, and we certainly have to meet a very critical fork in the road, um, as depicted on the right half of the screen. Um, we can either choose, as God gives each one the freedom of choice, uh, never coercing anyone uh, to do this, that, or any, anything, even though he desires for all to be saved. But we have to choose if we make a left or a right turn, if we choose the enemy and rebel to our eternal destruction, or do we seize hold of our Savior who extends his hand of sympathy and salvation. And along our journey we have plenty of, of our individual shares of temptations, distractions, uh, difficulties that will uh, swoop in front of us and uh, cloud our vision, uh, rain or shine, whether everything is smooth and rosy or very foggy and perplexing and discouraging. And certainly, uh, if we think back on what our original parents, Adam and Eve, encountered in the Garden of Eden with the uh, unique temptations they had, uh, ironically centered around the appetite of an appealing fruit that caused the tremendous aftermath that we're all living now because of sin. And yet, as depicted on the right half with God's word, as our right arm, we can fight against the foe and we can defeat with God's strength, not in our own efforts, but with full submission and asking God to help us overcome. And we all, as I mentioned earlier, have our share of trials and difficulties. And ironically, it's amazing how as from the uh, Testimonies to the Church, Volume 1, page 340, uh, passage is quoted here on the right half. Jesus sits as a refiner and purifier of his people. And when his image is perfectly reflected in them, they are prepared for translation. And so while it might not be comfortable, and often it isn't comfortable to be tried and squeezed and pressed and, and downcast, and trod under the foot of others in the stress of life, God desires to remove that dross and skim the surface of all the impurities in our lives as it bubbles from the heat of trial and intense tension. And in that crucible of trial, it's really also amazing how he desires to patiently wait with us until that reflection matches his, as he called us, be perfect as I am perfect. And he has set us the perfect example. And again, not in our strength, what a blessed thought that Jesus has made the way of salvation and he has offered the strength to overcome, just like he did all the temptations from Satan that he had to encounter in the wilderness and throughout his whole earthly life and ministry. As, uh, some folks who may know me uh, better than others, my personal uh, struggle has been time management, among other things. And one of the things that I struggle with is to slow down enough to give God a fighting chance to establish that connection with Him and start the day off on the right foot and to be better prepared for the temptations that should come my way, for the decisions that would have to be made and it truly does take effort on our part as human beings to 
crack open our daily planner and schedule books, and to make time to meet with God. And how amazing it is, certainly in my life, how Satan has all along known full well that if that is one thing humanity is allowed to do, to have access to their Savior, having already lost the fight against Satan, uh, against Christ, since he won the victory over death, paying the penalty of sin on the cross for us. He knows that if we spend more and more time with Jesus, he will have less and less of a controlled grip on us to pull us into hellfire, which he knows is where his destination and his demonic angels are headed to. And along with time management comes the unique struggle to make the environment such that as depicted here on the left half, as, a, as in a laboratory of Bible study, as in a dark room, as depicted of processing of a, a photographic x-ray film or what have you, and to focus undisturbed on the character of Christ and allowing him to reveal the difference that exists to whatever degree between where we are still and where he longs to bring us to. And it is not only through that dark room of prayer as depicted here, but truly plugging in our life cord to the source, which is God's Word. And in John chapter 1, verse 1, one of many well-known texts, God said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And when we plug into God's Word, we get to know Him and who He is. And he desires to reveal what he has done for us and to change and soften our hearts to recognize our need to reciprocate to his amazing, unconditional love, unmerited compassion. And in taking that closer look of self-analysis, certainly many of those scaly scabs on the surface that have thickened over the uh, stubborn fostering of our human tendencies, um, it certainly needs to be stripped away, peeled back, layer by layer. Whatever imperfections of character that might still be lurking and festering like a blister longing to be tweezered out of there and disinfected, God is the only one who offers that first aid kit for a spiritual healing. Ironically, I had a very interesting experience recently that the Lord only even more recently revealed an object lesson that I never knew was really hidden. And it had to do with an unbeknownst oil leak I had. Um, and it was certainly a huge, huge surprise to me. Um, but as I was reviewing that adventure I had of discovering it and with God's help repairing it, um, it was really interesting to see um, thereafter what the Lord uh, put together that was uh, hidden in the midst of all that, uh, that fixed problem. And as we study in God's Word, the one particular parable of the ten virgins certainly uh, came to life as I reflected on this uh, mechanical repair that I had in the garage recently. And uh, it is explained to us through Scripture that especially depicted in the uh, parable of the ten virgins, it is so important for our life spiritual lanterns to have sufficient oil representing the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we will not have lights trimmed and ready when the bridegroom cometh and Jesus takes his children home. And certainly, we are often discouraged, uh, perplexed, and we can get a bit fatigued and tired and fall asleep as all ten virgins were in that parable, and yet only five were wise enough to have enough oil. And getting back to this interesting mechanical repair, I didn't even know I was losing oil. And as the Lord gave me wisdom to attack this project, as I'm not exactly a, a, a seasoned mechanic, but I was impressed to tackle this project nonetheless. And as I scrubbed everything down and ran in another several days to see if I can pinpoint all that oil that uh, had been smeared on the uh, casing on the belly pan, as you can see there, um, sure enough, I noticed the, 
a fresh stain of the uh, oil in the second picture from the left that was starting to form. And it turns out it was, of all things, a banjo bolt that, interestingly enough, is perforated not only along the sides, but as in the hospital, using uh, surgical screws to help someone's broken hip back together, it's cannulated, meaning it's hollow down the length. And interestingly enough, the Lord revealed to me that our lives, as, as if a, a banjo bolt, so to speak, He desires the Holy Spirit to not only fill us, but to flow through us. But it is so important to have those O-rings sealed and fresh so we can contain it, so our vessels, our lanterns, don't lose the oil along the way. And as I was about to install this new banjo bolt, I thought, why isn't this going in? I was having the hardest of times, crunched in there on my back, inches from the floor, just barely managing with my big clumsy bare paws to squeeze in the crevice. And as the uh, second picture from the right uh, depicts, there was a serious misalignment issue. And I thought to myself, as the Lord, again, made these object lesson details clear as I reflected on this, how interesting that the Lord desires to first of all bring our lives in alignment with His before we can truly be filled to overflowing with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that we are promised. And another example that's depicted in Scripture is um, as a vineyard or a garden. Certainly the Lord, as the caretaker, desires to truly take care of our lives and to help our, our vineyards, our gardens, flourish and to thrive so that when the harvest time does come, there will be crop to gather in and there will be fruits of our labor to reap. And reflecting back on what was mentioned earlier, interestingly enough, the pruning uh, shears depicted as trials are necessary to snip off those unwanted, uh, burdensome suckers that would otherwise drain the life source out of us. And it certainly takes a lot of effort and prayer and dedication to till the soil as God uh, gives us strength and guides us through every row and every acreage and every area of our lives to make it fresh so that the seed sown can take root and flourish. And what is amazing is that He truly does promise us a harvest and fruits for our labors. Because if we are surrendered to Him, He will see to it that our efforts of surrendering to our Savior will not be in vain. And as we go from day to day, month by month, year to year, we certainly uh, leave a lot of footprints behind us. But often I ask myself, dear Lord, am I faithful in following in your footsteps? And the Lord calls each one of us to a diligent, committed, covenant bond with Him, an inseparable bond, the more time we spend with Him through obedience as the old hymn says, to trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. And has been repeated a number of times as a connecting thread, the, um, the removal of the things that would uh, otherwise keep us from heaven. Um, another example is the, the importance of uprooting the weed when it first appears at the first sign of a dying branch so that the whole tree doesn't end up suffering when it's uh, gone out of hand and not kept under a close watchful eye. And indeed we are comforted by the fact that our Savior has promised not only to come back but more importantly applying to us today, we're not just anywhere on the timeline of Earth's history, we are absolutely viewing the threshold of eternity. And as depicted in the Old Testament prophet Daniel's book, the prior earthly empires have come and gone, and we just simply see the feeble efforts of man, the subdivisions of the former Roman Empire, and the, the vain efforts to unite the kingdoms, the former nations that are now squabbling over the crumbs of the Roman Empire, trying to make something of it, trying to 
desperately bring the iron and clay that is futile, that the Lord says never mixes, neither is oil and water or any other example. And as we continue on closer towards that threshold of eternity, I certainly have been stopped in my track and have reflected on, dear Lord, have I some unfinished tasks yet to do? Am I perhaps, unbeknownst to me, naively thinking I'm all set and I'm, and I'm going to enter the safety of Noah's Ark, so to speak, while perhaps I'm longing for my other fellow friends, perhaps family, perhaps colleagues, that I'm perhaps in the same boat with them and I'm trying to keep the angel of God from closing the Ark of Safety to Noah's Ark, or perhaps keeping from the second coming of Christ's door, being even at the door from opening because I'm not ready, God forbid. Lord, help me to be surrendered and open to what you have to point out each and every day so that I can be better and better prepared and encourage us with others around me to be the same. And in that sharing of not only mercy and hope, but also a warning, I thought to myself, as uh, we'll read in the scripture reading, the book of Isaiah, chapter 56, verse 10, he read, His watchmen are blind, they are ignorant, they are all dumb dogs, they cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. And my conscience has pricked me awake uh, lately as I was gathering my, my notes prayerfully that so much of this in its entirety, all of it, applies to my life. God forbid I should ever come across to any listening ear thinking, I'm all set, I'm arrived. God forbid I am so much in need of that waking up so that I don't slumber as the Lord would have each one of us be the watchmen, the watchwomen on the wall, sounding the alarm, warning, just like dear Brenda recently studied about Paul Revere and his Minutemen. I'd like to think that the residents were grateful that they were stirred awake. And in the light of eternity, looking back, May it be so that those in God's kingdom will thank the remnant few for waking them up, for sharing them the truth of coming Savior back to earth and that there is hope for humanity. Not through blood in a sea, uh, not fluent in Latin, but in any case, the recent encyclical, encyclical from, um, from the current Pope in Rome, Pope Francis, not in a uh, Greenpeace campaign, not in a uh, in a movement towards uh, fixing things, because we have uh, climate change, or we have terrorism back in 2001, and, and, and many times before, and certainly since then, because we have a current health crisis. But rather that we turn to the Lord and allow Him to um, to be the only one. Um, given permission to fix all the problems because only he has the answer. And interestingly enough, the Lord clearly has uh, made it clear to me that oftentimes I have rested my head on the pillow of complacency. That while there was work to do, I ignored the nudge of the Holy Spirit's tap on my shoulder, and I rather stepped on and took a nap and put off those witnessing opportunities or time aside when the Lord would call me to uh, a season of prayer or to read his word for encouragement. And as with all things regarding habit, it is very easy to either get stuck in a bad habit, and certainly in our human efforts to try to break it, all the same in trying to start a good habit. I've always considered that to be an equal challenge, especially if we do try to do it vainly in our own human efforts. But I wonder, as the enemy of souls, Satan himself, would have it, does he perhaps desire this current crisis to put that so-called gag mask of timidity over our mouths so that as the time is nearing to sign off, as it says, when Christ is about to come, would perhaps Satan have it that this particular fiasco that we're seeing in the world 
is just what you would have to further create an undertow under the footing of God's faithful minutemen soldiers so that they wouldn't stand their ground, so that they wouldn't speak boldly from the mountaintops, allowing all to hear and decide for themselves as the Lord says, choose you this day whom you will serve. We are called to make a decision, each one of us. No one will ever be coerced into hell's fire for destruction or unto salvation into heaven's kingdom. Forced, it will all be our own accord, our own choosing. And God will gladly honor those that have taken sides with him, recognizing their need of a savior. And he will utterly, with great painful reluctance, accept the decision of those who go with Satan to their eternal graves. But praise the Lord that we don't need to be content with our caged in complacency, our, our restrictive leash that would hold us back and hinder us, but rather we can set aside our, our risk management strings and, and, and baggage and burdens that would hold us back and keep wind from our sails as the Lord would drive us across these increasingly tempestuous seas, as small as the Sea of Galilee was, how interesting that it was so stormy, so violent, so quick. And it doesn't take much. If we simply take our eyes off of Jesus like Peter, we will sink. But Jesus is there to pick us up as long as we stay true to him and keep our eyes on him. And certainly we have a challenge while we're called to keep a certain distance out of precaution. And certainly there's a whole lot of sense in being sensibly precautious and using respiratory etiquette and hand washing and whether an individual works in healthcare or not, that is just pure common sense, which unfortunately is greatly depleted from this earth nowadays. And ironically, many folks are downright offended if any hint of shedding light on a lot of lack of common sense is, is shared by anyone, even in the best of intentions to help prevent disease or help them find a savior, whatever the case may be. And with this challenge before us, it is very clear also that besides the, the so-called gag order that Satan would want to put over us, he would desire for us to stay away from those that are otherwise destitute, longing for that, that filling of only God, of, of what only God can fill us with, that void that only he can overflowingly fill, longing to do that for us. But truly we are in a spiritual battle, and each day is a war zone. And Satan is not only a disgruntled pussycat, but he is a roaring lion, viciously seeking roundabout, night and day, everywhere who he may devour. And he doesn't want to have the flames of hell only consume him and the third of the heavenly host that rebelled initially, not as a conspiracy, but as thus saith the word fact of history. And I'd like to think that in the often quoted phrase of even our late President John F. Kennedy, who's been quoted to have said, things don't happen, things are made to happen. This current crisis, while there is certainly a lot of truth to the evils, to the illnesses, to the wickedness in the world, it would be sheer ignorance not to acknowledge that. But besides that, God forbid, more importantly, that we be so ignorant to think that there isn't an evil demonic demising, scheming in the backgrounds, hiding behind the veil, withholding the truth, hidden in the curtain, so that people don't see things for what they are, but the one that's really at stake. The Lord would want us to reach out to folks, yes, with prayerful diligence and, and with, with, with a sensible uh, tact, and not to be absolutely rebellious just for the sake of rocking the boat and seeing whom, he, whom they may upset, whatever the powers might be. The Lord offers us an amazing light of liberty through Christ in his holy word. And ironically, the lesser light of the spirit of prophecy seeks to uphold that torch, that flame of truth, and how cleverly Satan has devised so that that arm, that so-called statue of liberty arm, to make a very feeble comparison, would have that cutting torch cut that iron off from, from, from New York Harbor so that others don't see that beacon of safety. More importantly, God's light of liberty is a light for the remnant church, for you, for me, for everyone out there who professes to believe in the three angels' messages, the present truth for this time that God desires for all to hear, to accept, 
to welcome into their hearts with joy unto salvation. And what's interesting is that we can truly seek God's Word for the wisdom, for the guidance, for every single decision-making, however big or small or trivial, come what may, night and day, He desires to help us through all of life's tasks. And from Psalms 119.24 we read, Thy testimonies are my delight and my counselors. God forbid we ever get offended when God would have us be counseled by through His Word. And on the top left, we see a whole bunch of American flags. We've been so blessed living in this country, a land flowing with milk and honey, so to speak. So many freedoms and privileges that are steadily being eroded right before our eyes, whether we realize it or not. And while we may run our errands and take care of chores, and perhaps if those involved in arts and crafts need something from, let's say, Hobby Lobby, this is what they can easily find on their entrance doors. Closed Sundays to allow employees time for family and worship. Initially, at first glance, one might think, how thoughtful and considerate, what a gracious accommodation. Naturally, we live in America. That's lovely. And we take it, and we keep on walking, we do our shopping, we go home, think nothing of it. Or perhaps, if we consider what the Bible has to say of what will be at the toenail end of time, the true test of genuine Bible-based worship of God's seventh-day Sabbath or a spurious counterfeit replacement that is trying to be pawned off and sold as God's change his mind replacement. And perhaps these closed Sundays uh, to allow for family time and worship might currently be seen as a gracious accommodation. Is this only certain, is this perhaps only the hints of a merciless mandate down the line to come, when that graciousness will fade away and folks will have at a great peril, at great risk to their lives, at sure penalty, have to consider are they going to stand up for God's true seventh day Sabbath as we read in His Word? Will they stand like Daniel's friends on the plain of Dura? Will they, as in ancient Babylon, in the current confusion of modern-day Babylon, will they stand firm or will the, their knees buckle at the sound of the music when instructed to bend your knee, when instructed to, to do this or to do that, for the sake of peace or to avoid risk to our loved ones if they would, should be threatened? For the enemy knows all too well how to get under us and how to get us to buckle and to, and to forfeit our faith, God forbid. The Lord truly would have us stand tall, show our true colors, yet in the midst of all this, the Lord will, will long to help His children stand through the, the bullet holes, riddling those lives, metaphorically, of persecution, being poked and picked at, any which way to get us from the enemy, of course, not to stand true, not to show our true colors of who, he, we, prefer, who we profess to represent, but may be so evident that there's no doubt left in anyone's mind when they behold us as professed Christians in these last days, who we represent, what we believe, and why. May it not come from a staunch, stiff-necked, tight-lipped, uptight, unapproachable, set of doctrines, but may it, as was discussed at Sabbath school this past Sabbath, may it truly come from an outflowing recognition of our Savior's love for us and reciprocating our love for Him because of what Jesus has done for us on Calvary and what He is currently doing interceding in the closing hours of probation as our High Priest in the heavenly sanctuaries, in the heavenly sanctuary, soon to finish and soon to finally complete with the harvesting of souls, gathering His children home. I pray that each one of us will be so committed to that daily decision-making, getting closer to our Savior, so that we all can truly make it, no matter what the peril, no matter what the, the persecution uh, onslaught should be, the Lord is mightier, the Lord is greater than the Lord has promised.
The Lord will help us to build on that solid rock, not on man-made theories, but on God's sure word as the coming storm approaches. He will help us to have our lamps trimmed and burning so there's enough wattage in that light bulb of the lighthouse of hope and safety so it doesn't go dim, so it doesn't burn out, so we don't fall asleep on the job. And so that souls don't shipwreck against the shore. And while it might be argued in this uh, current relative safety and peace that you can pick just about any, any, any vessel and you could head out fishing, have a great weekend, but there is a storm approaching and the only vessel that will not capsize, brothers and sisters, is God's holy word, the Bible. But it's not merely a club of just mere membership or label wearing tag. To be certain of passage and ultimately for our salvation, we must live aboard and must become a part of our lives so that we don't profess to know about God's word, but to know the word, as John 1 verse 1 says, the word was with God and the word was God. The word is God, and he desires to reveal himself to us the more time we spend in his word, and not just reading it, but living it. desires of us to take advantage of whatever grains of sand in that that hourglass of time is left, of relative peace and tranquility to help prepare us for the storms of life when we will most certainly, if we haven't been already, buffeted by Satan himself any which way to get us, if not to capsize or to become destroyed one way or another, but at least to get so discouraged where we throw it in and we quit trying. The Lord promised in Psalms chapter 50, verse 15, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Praise the Lord that we have a helmsman, a helmsman that is not just any captain of the ship. He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. In the same way he rested peacefully on the boat while the disciples thought they would capsize, we need not fear, for he can stand today and tell the winds, peace be still, just like he did back then on the Sea of Galilee. And whether we go through life with a perfect health, hardly ever needing to go to the doctor, many folks are sick indeed, and their lives are being pummeled and dragged down and picked apart and stripped away that we can often feel like we're coming to our wit's end and we're full of sorrow and tears but one day soon and very soon God promises to wipe away every tear from the eyes and there will be no more death, crying or pain in God's kingdom for the former things have passed and he will make all things new and no more wilting of the slightest flower plume but everything will stand beautifully Beautifully upright, flourishing, never more to die, a return to God's original Garden of Eden plan. What a blessed thought that there is hope for humanity. Despite the looming uh, hints of war and trouble, and many folks wondering, especially now with all the perplexity, what is this world coming to? What is happening? But what a blessed contrast God's rainbow promise of Jesus Christ's soon second return against the blacker clouds, all the more beautiful to see that hopeful promising rainbow. And indeed, the Lord has promised that he will not forget. He has given us so many so-called forget-me-nots here on earth, right on ground level, besides the rainbow in the heavens, to remind us and reassure us of that. is a master builder, a master mason, a carpenter, what have you, he himself will see to it that the arch is soon complete with his soon second coming, and that he will make something beautiful of our lives as he gives us the strength, as he responds to us giving permission to him. And one day soon indeed there will be, as promised, that river of life and the tree of life that God's redeemed can safely partake of, never more to part, never more to suffer, never more to experience anything of what we have our 
ourselves or others experienced throughout the ages on this earth of sin. So indeed, preparation is needed and encouraged, but certainly we will be buffeted from either the love of the world, false religion, a sense of, well, maybe that's old-fashioned thinking, and I need to blend in with the crowd. God protect us from the ecumenical undertow that is increasingly gaining sway and control of the masses of otherwise well-meaning, diligently praying, dedicated people. And many times, that so-called undertow, spiritually speaking, creeps in and takes our footing out from underneath us. And that so-called quicksand fills up around us as we lose more and more ground. But praise be to God that he will give us strength to hold on to the faith once the faith once delivered unto the saints. And the Lord will help us prepare here and now for what will soon to come. And my closing thoughts, with the steady eye of faith, as we gaze out onto the horizon from the window of our earthly home, may we never lose sight of our fast approaching heavenly home. With longing hearts for that blessed reunion, may we recognize Bible prophecy as it is being fulfilled and appreciate the tremendously monumental signs of the signs of the times all around us. May we never shirk our God-given duty to bravely share, not with, not with hesitation or embarrassment, but with zeal and holy boldness as God provides it, the three angels' message as preserved present truth for these last days. May we joyfully encourage one another with the many beautiful evidences of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ's soon second coming. May God shield us from the onslaught that surrounds us. For indeed we are in a battle, but victory is already won by the Lord. And we are safe under his banner, on his side, behind and next to him. May God help us to indeed be his peculiar remnant church believers entrusted with the sobering commission and privilege to loudly herald from the mountaintops the call out of Babylon and into the safe hole the safe fold of our true shepherd. May we trust completely and only in our Redeemer to help us persevere to the very end. For as the song says, for in a little while we are going home. Come whatever may, may we prayerfully purpose in our hearts to daily stay true to our high calling in Christ Jesus. And as did Martin Luther before his persecuting prosecutors, be able to declare, even in these modern times, these end of days, here I stand, I can do no other, so help me God. And in closing, I will read, ironically, from the same, same prophet Isaiah's book, a few chapters over, my personal favorite, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10 and 13. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I 